Welcome aboard the Bitcoin Express. My name is Chase. Let's get to it. In today's video, we're going to talk about consensus algorithms that you probably didn't know about. What is a consensus algorithm? There are algorithms that are used so that people in distributed, decentralized networks around the world can play fairly and come to an agreement. It's important to remember when you're speaking of decentralized blockchain technology, it consists of nodes around the world that don't know each other. It's hard to know what other people's intentions are, whether they're going to play fairly or try, and try to ruin the system. These are unknown characters, unknown people, so there needs to be rules in place to ensure that the system or the blockchain will be valid and that everyone plays fairly. So everyone on a blockchain, they're trying to add the next block of information onto the chain, and we wanna make sure that this block is truthful, no one changes it, and no one's manipulating data. So the way we get there is using consensus algorithms where everyone can come to an agreement. And most consensus algorithms on a public blockchain, they share the same traits or the same characteristics. And that includes, first off, it costs money to, pay, to play, pay to play. If it was free to just join the network, anyone can jump on, spam the network, and you know really mess with the network so it costs money to play there's a resource that you need to use to be a participant on the network and then the other two things that most of these consensus algorithms include are rewards and punishment they have a reward so that if you play to the rules if you play fair if everyone can come to an agreement there'll be a incentive there'll be a reward and now, if you don't, if you go on the network and you try to attack the network, you'll be penalized and you'll lose that resource. So the most common ones we know about and that you probably know about are proof of work and proof of stake. Proof of work is what Bitcoin runs on. And if you remember what I just said, all of these consensus algorithms, they have a resource, you know, pay to play, and they also have a reward and a punishment. And to show you an example, this is how Bitcoin works with Bitcoin. The resource is electricity cost and hardware cost. So it's not free. And as time goes on, this becomes even more expensive. So why would someone want to participate on this network if it costs so much money? Of course, the answer is there is a reward. If they play fairly, if they play according to the rules and they're able to add the next block onto the blockchain, they'll receive a mining fee, they'll receive a mining reward and they'll also receive transaction fees. So they're rewarded. Now, if someone is on the network and they're spending all these resources of electricity and hardware, but they say, I'm not going to play to the rules, I'm going to play unfair, everyone else on the, on the network will notice this and they'll decline that person from ever adding a block to the blockchain. Now that person, the punishment they receive is they spent all that money on electricity, on hardware, and they got nothing in return. The other popular consensus algorithm that we are familiar with is proof of stake. And this has been seen as a, a more practical, a better, better alternative to proof of work. Because with proof of work, you're spending so much money on electricity and it might be harmful to the environment. And also the computer hardware is just too expensive. So with proof of stake, instead of the resource being electricity and hardware, the resource is the token itself. So there are no mining of tokens. All the tokens exist already. An example of a project that uses proof of stake is EOS. So instead of putting up computer hardware and electricity, you stake your tokens on the network. So you lock them up and because you lock them up, you get voting power so that you can now add blocks to the blockchain. And the reward is if you do this successfully, you will receive a reward in transaction fees and you'll also eventually receive your staked tokens back. So that's what causes people to want to maintain a healthy network. But what stops someone on proof of stake from acting in a bad way, trying to attack the network? Well, the punishment is you get slashed tokens, meaning if you're, if you're proposing transactions on a proof of stake blockchain and other people see this, you can have your token slashed, meaning taken away from you. So again, there's a monetary loss. It's important to note that all of these rewards and and punishments, they're all monetary. So I mentioned proof of work and proof of stake. But as I mentioned, there's a whole list of other protocols that not many people are familiar with. A very popular 
guide or family are the Nakamoto protocols. And these are named after Satoshi Nakamoto, who is the creator of Bitcoin. One example would be proof of activity, with, which is a combination of proof of work and proof of stake. The first half of this process includes proof of work, and then the second half includes proof of stake. So again, it uses a resource, there's a punishment and a reward. I'm briefly going over these because the truth is you can take just one of these algorithms and it could take you weeks or even months, depending how far you wanna dive into it to really learn about it. So I'm just giving you a very general overview. Another, another consensus protocol of the Nakamoto consensus protocol family is proof of burn. And this is a little similar to proof of stake. We know in proof of stake, you lock up tokens and then if you behave fairly, you do the right thing, you can get a fee as a reward. But with proof of burn, your tokens aren't locked up and then you can get them back one day. They're burned. So the punishment already starts at the beginning. This one is not very common. The only one that uses this is Slimcoin. And just to go right back to proof of activity, the only project we know that's using that is called Decred. So proof of burn and proof of activity, not very popular projects. People don't really use them. Another Nakamoto protocol is proof of capacity. And as we mentioned, there's always a resource. So the resource and proof of capacity is hardware drives, is, ha is hard drive space. And these are terabytes of hard drive space. So it's very expensive as well. So it costs money to buy this hard drive space. And again, if you don't play fairly and you try to ruin the network, you're never going to add the next block. You're not gonna receive a reward. So you're just gonna lose out. And then another one that's not popular at all is called proof of elapsed time. And the reason this one is not popular is because it's not a true decentralized protocol because it requires trust in the third party. I guess the resource you could say here is just waiting a specific amount of time, but this is done through a trusted execution environment. And in this case, Intel, the company, they have a, they have a protocol they use where people on the network they have to wait a certain amount of time. But again, in this case, we have to put our trust in a third party. So this one is not popular. This isn't really, I would say, part of decentralized protocols. So I went over a few protocols here, part of the Nakamoto consensus family, but there are so many more. There are other consensus algorithms that are not part of the traditional blockchain space or Nakamoto consensus protocols, such as practical Byzantine fault tolerance, simplified Byzantine fault tolerance, something known as directed acyclic graph technology as well, or they call it DAG for short. IOTA is a cryptocurrency that uses DAG technology. So not all these cryptocurrencies you see on CoinMarketCap actually are blockchain. For example, as I just mentioned, IOTA, which is a pretty popular cryptocurrency, they run on DAG technology. Now this whole concept of consensus algorithms, where people can come to an agreement even though they don't know each other or they live far away on different sides of the world. This isn't a invention that came out with Bitcoin and blockchain in 2009. This has been around for quite some time in the computer science space. There is a protocol, a family of protocols in consensus called Paxos. And these ideas were first published in 1989 by someone named Leslie Lamport, who is a very prominent figure in this space of computer science and consensus algorithms. Even proof of work, what Bitcoin uses as their consensus algorithm is also a older concept. The idea was first presented in 1993 in a journal and even the term proof of work was first coined in 1999. So these concepts have been around for a long time but they have just gotten better over time. So as you can see, there's so many protocols and something I didn't mention is even within a protocol, there's so many different variations. Let's say you take proof of stake, there's naive proof of stake, there's delegated proof of, stake, proof of stake. Then for example, Ethereum right now works on proof of work and in the future they're planning on transitioning to something called Casper proof of stake. So there are so many types of algorithms and even within each protocol, each family, there are so many variations. Everything I just went over, are for decentralized public blockchains. But as we know, there's also something known as private blockchains where not anyone is allowed. You need to have a special permission to join this network. 
And even within the private blockchain space, they also use consensus algorithms. And there are so many. There's Hyperledger, which is a very popular protocol family. But even within the Hyperledger family, you have projects such as Hyperledger Bisu, Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Sawtooth, and the list goes on. Some other business enterprise private blockchains other than Hyperledger are Corda and R3. So the takeaway from this video is not to teach you what all of these things are in depth, because as I mentioned, that will take weeks, months, and if you really wanted to know all of them, it would take you years. But the whole point here is to know that when you go on CoinMarketCap and you see all these cryptocurrencies, right now at the moment we have about 5,000 cryptocurrencies. At first, when you enter the blockchain and crypto space, you look at these and you think, they're all blockchain, they're all the same. What's the difference? But when you further dive in and learn, you start to realize that all of these projects run on different pro protocols. And even ones that run on the similar family of protocols run on different variations. Again, for example, a lot of tokens on CoinMarketCap run on proof of stake, but they run on different models or different variations of proof of stake. We are so early in the blockchain space. We're still in the early adopters phase. And not many people know about blockchain technology at the time. And as we move forward, we start to learn more about these consensus algorithms. And we're trying to debate which one is the best. It's even possible, as we see with Ethereum, that you can start with one algorithm. And then later on in the project's life, lifetime, you can actually switch to another algorithm. It could be that the best algorithm, the most efficient one, the safest one, isn't even in existence yet today. Again, like I mentioned, we're so early on in the blockchain space. In 10 years from now, 20 years from now, blockchain technology will truly revolutionize the way that we live our lives. I hope that you found value in today's video. And if you like my content, go down below, subscribe to the channel, show some love. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.